Thank you. Uh, so my name is Sergei Sharibin, and today's presentation will be presented by me and my friend Kir Mierl. And he'll basically speak about major events in developing of Blender over previous year. So mine happenings were like uh, code pipeline cleanup, VSE improvements, compositor improvements, all sorts of improvements. It was actually all documented in the release notes, and it's kind of boring. So today's presentation would be focused on uh, motion tracker, like general development, and Google Summer of Code of motion tracker. And uh, motion tracker will be presented by Kier. Yep. What? OK. So motion tracker will, will be presented by Kier, and I will st uh, speak about the, such topic as dependency graph. Can I s ask how many of you know what dependency graph is? Oh. Oh, I expected less hands, okay, that's cool. So, th th this is actually a really, really easy dependency graph from Tube project, but side note. So, dependency graph is basically an internal representation of scene inside the Blender, and it helps Blender to keep track of which data blocks use which another data blocks, and which they depend on each other, and in what, what is more important is in which order uh, these data blocks need to be updated when you change frame or when you change animation and stuff like this. Here's an example. So here we've got a Susan, which is parented to a cube. And uh, on the left, you can see the Blender scene. And on the right, it's a um, uh, dependency graph. And basically, you cannot uh, uh, say position of the Susan for until you know position of the cube. This the idea. And this is how Blender keeps track of in which order to update them. And currently, dependency graph is single-threaded. So every single, uh, all the objects will be updated in the single thread, which is kind of slow. And my goal is to make, uh, well, basically make dependency graph threaded. And it divides in, into separate topics. First one is to make it so objects are updated in separate threads. Like, you can update independent object in separate threads. And another major topic is to make it stable to render scene while you are editing it. And uh, another like, more long-term goal is to make be able to uh, support animation prefetching, having uh, different windows having different times, which might be used for animators. And it's actually a pretty huge project, which, uh, which was break down into three steps. First one is to make uh, code trade safe. Uh, second one is to work on uh, threaded objects updates. And third one is uh, addressed to have to solve uh, issues with uh, render and viewport conflicts, which is called local graphs. So in a bit of detail, so thread safety. So uh, current rank is have got a bunch of static variables, global variables, which are not safe for trading. And for until it's solved, you cannot do anything about trading. So first step of my Google Summer of Code was to make sure that uh, all the code is nicely tradable. It required quite enough of changes in metabols, which used static variables all over the place, and curves were, were not safe for trading because of the way how modifiers have been applied on them. Modifiers for uh, stack on meshes wasn't uh, thread safe. And all sorts of things, it was just, here it's just major things, and there were lots of them like discovered uh, while you work on this project. Uh, course de deserves a bit more words about it, because uh, it wasn't possible to solve, to make them thread safe without breaking compatibility. And this is uh, because of uh, uh, texture space, which, is, which was related, uh, which was relied on a tessellated curve. And the thing is that uh, texture space is a object data block, object data property, and tessellation is an object property. So it's like screwing up a parent uh, ownership in other way around. So uh, c currently, in my branch, which is going to be merged pretty soon into trunk, yeah, we changed it so texture space is b based on uh, control points, positions, and their radius. It might break some files, but uh, to kind of work around these regressions, there is a button to match texture space to tessellated curve. Uh, when this code things were solved, uh, it was able to work on threaded object updates. 
And for normal human beings, it means that uh, you'll have better uh, interactivity of Blender by, today, by using all the CPU power for frame update. And this particular part of project works within single uh, frame. So all the objects within single frame will be uh, try to be updated in separate threads when it's possible. Uh, it affects on uh, animation playback and also ma can make uh, tweaks within single frame uh, more interactive in cases when you've got like multiple objects uh, parented to the uh, one parent and when this parent will like allow multi-threaded update of its children. Uh, and it uses dynamic uh, task scheduling which uh, balances load uh, evenly across all the threads. Uh, it works nice, really nice when you've got like multiple animated characters, but it might also work in some circumstances when you've got uh, single characters. For example, you've got a rig and pretty heavy meshes uh, parented to this rig. In this case, it will also help. But uh, it should, it does not affect on performance if uh, object evaluation cannot be multi-threaded. In this case, it, uh, speed will be exactly the same as in current rank. So there is no speed regressions at all. And dynamic task scheduling basically means that we've got lots of tasks, and we've got uh, several threads which can handle these tasks, and task scheduler keeps uh, checks that one thread is ready, it gets, uh-huh, we've got new task in the queue, and it assigns this task to the thread and uh, keeps track of these things, and uh, it allows to balance load really nice. And here is an example how update happens within a uh, blender. So first data block which is, can be evaluated is a scene block because it does not depend on anything else. And cube lamp and camera uh, does not, uh, depends on only scene and might be uh, scheduled for update as soon as scene data block is up to date. And as soon as all the, uh, uh, as soon as cube is up to date, then we can uh, schedule Susan and Sphere for update. And we are done. Uh, and after this was done, it leaves us to local graphs. And idea is to separate state of objects between render and viewport, because uh, depending on uh, constraint and uh, modifier settings, uh, object might be like be on one position for viewport and another position for rendering. And it's not possible to do with current design and local graphs uh, aim to solve this. And it will also allow to have a uh, duple group local time offset and uh, different time different windows and animation prefetching. And there are a couple of more issues, but anyway. And to support local graphs, we added an uh, entity which is called evaluation context. And basically, it's a replacement for old school global is rendering flag, which is Really, fi it fails dramatically, especially in cases when you've got like viewport rendering, of, uh, final rendering, and v regular viewport. And it's also all sorts of threading issues in this case. And this context contains all the local data for the graph itself. And uh, it's been passed to uh, all the object update routines. So. Object update function, no, for fact, we, whether it should be like viewport rendering or uh, final rendering, and so on. And currently in the branch there are uh, two ownership of this evaluation context. View, you need a uh, evaluation context for viewport, which is uh, owned by main data structure. And for rendering, it's render engine itself owns this data. And here is the thing, uh, which is currently we are working on is copy on the right. Because to, to have the same object on two different positions, we basically need two copies of this object. But uh, you need to be really careful to not copy data which is not actually being modified by a local graph. And copy on the right uh, solve this issue nicely by uh, sharing the same, uh, sharing data blocks which are not modified by a uh, graph between different graphs, but as soon as someone uh, modifies the data block, uh, it copies this transparently for uh, every user of this object. And it's also flexible enough to support uh, RLA uh, data compression, which might also be used for such things as uh, proxies. 
So this is this opens the door for for real proxies for any data block in scene. But uh, it doesn't increase stability if you do disruptive changes while you are rendering. For example, if you are rendering and you start modifying uh, UV layers or mesh topology, well, oops, it still might crash, but at least something. And copy and write extends the idea of evaluation context because it all the all the copied data blocks are stored in uh, evaluation context. And for uh, those who like who works on object update routines, it's basically two functions, which is get object well, get data block for read, which will either get object from uh, its copied storage or will get you original one and uh, get data block for write will give you a like, copied object all the time if it wasn't copied uh, yet. It's still under uh, discussion with other developers, but uh, I think within next weeks it will be implemented. So here are the results of uh, Google Summer of Code project. Code, code is now uh, safe for trading and uh, for now, we are dealing with uh, destructive rendering by adding uh, option to do a locked interface while rendering. It will still allow you to browse uh, the image editor to zoom in and out and pan it, but uh, you wouldn't be able to do any, ch any changes at all to your scene. Uh, we did some optimization of the code, like um, log-free memory locator, which gives us around like 50% of speed up in uh, regular scenes, and uh, also shape keys were rewritten a little bit, which gives us like 100% of speed up on regular cases. And, uh, and there were also issues when uh, you're using su subdivision surface plus booleans, that final rendering w was using uh, previous settings of subdivision because of dependency graph failure. And Object update is now traded, and it was confirmed by Bassam, I think, during Tube project, and on his dual CPU system, it was two times speed up. It's pretty nice. Uh, Evaluation context has been implemented, which fixed some bugs from the tracker, but uh, copy and write proposal is still like under the review. So hopefully it will happen pretty soon, and Within like next week, I hope to merge uh, most of the parts from branch to the trunk. And at this point, I give microphone to Kier. Hi. So I uh, I work on the motion tracking component in Blender, and uh, I was curious actually, how many of you have tried the motion tracker? Cool. So that's great. Yeah. Nice. Uh, how many of you have used the motion tracker on a, on a serious project other than just a camera test? Wow, that's great. And how many of you have used it commercially? Very cool. Uh, okay, so I'm going to chat a little bit about some of the things that have been happening in, uh, in the camera tracker for the last year. So actually, I'm going to open up with uh, a little bit about this planner tracking stuff. So on this picture, you can see we've got a, a poster on the side of the highway there. And in the second frame, it's been replaced with this little image about tracking. Um, and so this is planar tracking. But uh, recently, we added a whole new version of planar tracking. And if you were following along, um, we actually already had a planar tracker for, for tracking individual points. But we added a new one, which is intended for tracking large regions. And it works a little differently. So I'll go through that. Um, but the, pr the purpose of the plane tracker is to replace billboards or, or screens on footage. Uh, this new planar tracker integrates nicely with masking and compositing, uh, and this should be available shortly. So let me show you a little bit of video done with the new, um, the new planar tracker. So you may have already seen this in the, in the YouTube video. Uh, oh, it looks like, oh, sorry about this, technical difficulties. So what you're looking at is uh, a scene filmed by, I believe, Sebastian. And up in the, the top left here, there's a window where we've inserted this little texture. And this is done using, using the new planar tracker. Um, 
and it's, it's also using the integrated compositor node that we also added. So let me go through this a little bit for those of you who haven't uh, seen the YouTube video where Sergey and myself talk about this. Uh, okay, so how does this thing work? Well, the idea is that we, we reuse the existing point tracker uh, in order to define a plane. So what you do is you track some points that exist on a plane in the world. In this case, the plane is just the side of this brick wall. Uh, and then there's a plane that's implied by the deformation of these tracks. And that plane is what we reconstruct for the planar tracker. And then with the, that plane that moves around as the camera does, uh, there's a quad that also deforms according to the plane. Uh, now, what we did is a little different than uh, what you might think of as a planar tracker in that the quad that's moving around is, is actually not the plane. So, so the plane is this thing that's defined by the motion of the, of the points in the scene, right? The actual physical motion of the plane. Um, but on top of that, you place this quad, which is the plane quad, and that's what you use when you're compositing. So inside that plane quad, you'll insert an image or another video that's eventually composited with the rest of your footage. But actually, in the implementation, that plane quad can move around independently from the way the plane is moving. Um, and, and that's sort of the third concept here, which is that you can keyframe this independently. So the workflow is you do your tracking of the points, you put your quad down, and then you'll watch the quad moves around with, with the points as with the plane, but perhaps you need to move the quad for some reason, and you can do so because it is keyframed independently. Uh, and that motion is blended in, so I'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so one question we get sometimes is, why don't you just track the corners? You know, it's a corner pin in, in some other technology. Why do we do that? And the reason is that really there's no restriction on using corners. The plane is defined by any four or more points uh, that happen to exist on the plane. And in practice, occlusions will make it so that you may not be able to actually see the four corners of some screen or, or other object that you want to put something on top of, and so that's why we don't call it a, a corner pin or a corner tracker. Um, yes, and if you have more points, the, the estimation will be more accurate. Other thing is you don't need four continuous tracks. So tracks can come and go, and that's just fine. As long as between each subsequent frame there's at least four tracks, then the planar tracking should work fine. Uh, and if you have stability issues with the tracks, you can just add more, and the result should be nicer. Uh, oh, how does it work? Pretty straightforward. For each frame pair, we just estimate a homography. Um, the way that works is you do a rough algebraic estimation, which is a closed form solution. That's pretty easy to get, but it's not very accurate, so then we refine it with this thing called Serra Solver, which uh, is integrated in Blender as well. It sort of takes a guess that's not quite perfect and then just sort of tweaks the transformation a little bit so that it better matches uh, the tracks that are in the scene. And then the plane quad, which is what you guys actually interact with on the canvas, is warped to match this transformation. Uh, oh, keyframing. So this is a subtle issue. Sometimes if you're tracking a plane through the scene, maybe you navigate to the middle of your, of your clip and you decide that you actually want to move this quad a little bit so that perhaps it better covers a monitor or a, or a poster on the wall. Uh, when you do that, there are two things that can happen. If auto keyframe is off, when you move that quad, we'll in fact reevaluate the position of the quad on all the other frames um, to match what the plane movement is doing. There's another mode though, which is auto keyframe on, where if you tweak the corners, it doesn't actually redo the motion in the other frames. It will change the position on the current frame, but then it will do a, sl a smooth blend of the position to the other frames so that you can kind of match the position. Because sometimes, although you tracked things that are in theory on the plane, in practice, perhaps one of the trackers was actually slightly elevated or something like that, and so it's not perfectly planar. And in that case, there can be some slipping, and using auto keyframe, you can fix the slight slippage without having uh, disturbing footage. Uh, and this brings us to the summer of code stuff. So we did a couple of things this summer with uh, student Joseph Mansfield. Um, one of the first things Joseph worked on is focal length constraints during solve. 
So something that can happen is you might have a, a long shot, a very long focal length, so you're, you're fairly zoomed in on a scene. And in that case, there isn't always a lot of depth information. And if that's true, then the, the bundler, which is the, the final step of reconstruction where it's carefully adjusting sort of the focal length and the, the 3D position of the points to best match the tracked data. Uh, in that case, the, the bundler can see that, oh, look, if I just make the focal length really, really big, I can make the error ever so slightly small, and you get these crazy focal length values out, which is no good. So we added a, a constraint system to this, so you can say, don't make the focal length more than, you know, 5,000 millimeters or something like that. So this isn't quite on trunk yet, but it's pretty much ready to go. Should be merged soon. Uh, the other thing that's in the pipeline, but also is not quite ready, is multi-camera reconstruction. So this is handy in the case that perhaps you have one camera that's shooting the main scene and uh, there's concern that there isn't going to be enough depth or you just want to have sort of extra data to be sure you'll be able to reconstruct everything in 3D. You can have multiple cameras. Now, currently this is not supported, but this is pretty far along in development now. The, the back-end vision code is mostly implemented. The UI isn't ready yet, so that's still going to take a little while to get finished. Um, but this should be nice. This has been a, a requested feature. Uh, I think Sergey has something to add at this point. Yeah, there are. Can I ask if Sebastian is here? Yeah, here you are. So everyone actually has a hobby. And I do have a hobby like to code something while you're sitting in the gate before going to a plane to travel to Amsterdam. And I did this time as well, which is employ something really heavy, like a weight at something, combined with a track, which implies us weighted tracks, which is actually on my laptop currently, and which is ready to go to trunk. <laughs> yeah, so it will be committed like just after the presentation, and yeah, so. Just for those who don't know why this is useful, sometimes you'll have a, a marker at the edge of the scene that is there and then hits the edge of the frame because it's off camera, and that will cause the solve to sort of snap over a few pixels. It's very disturbing visually. Weighted tracks will let you animate that off so there's sort of a drop off in the influence of the marker that will disappear. Uh, okay, so what's happening in the future? Well, this is up for, for debate, and what we work on really is decided by you guys who are using this. Uh, I think what's, aside from various small things that need to get added, probably what's on the top of my list personally is to add a, an auto track button. So I know this is something that's been often requested. I've, I've resisted adding this because uh, you can kind of do everything with the manual tracker and I've found that enhancing the guided tracking has paid off pretty well. But I think we've kind of reached that time where the other stuff works pretty well and it's probably time to start considering doing some automatic stuff so you guys can track really quickly uh, if you don't need a super perfect track. Other thing that's been requested that I'd like to add is survey data. Um, this was not possible for a long time because we didn't have a really good bundler, but now that we've switched to Ceres Solver, which is what we use for bundling, it's very flexible, uh, this is possible. Survey data is like, let's say you're doing an object track, so perhaps a character is carrying something around in the scene and there's just like a few points on this that you're able to track, like it's a box. Uh, in, in the video, it's actually occupying just a small portion of the view, and what that means for reconstruction is that the depth data is not well constrained, and so this can lead to unstable tracks. Um, but something you could potentially do, not in Blender currently, but uh, that's what this is about, is have a 3D model that mimics what that object was in the world, and since you know the 3D structure of some of those points, you can make pretty stable solves. Uh, whereas if you're trying to reconstruct the shape of the object as well as the camera um, with sort of poor data, it doesn't always work that well. So that's survey data. Uh, other thing I'd like to add is constraining certain tracks as being in front or behind that's kind of related to the survey data stuff, but is a little bit um, easier to implement. The other one that I find personally really interesting because my focus is more on computer vision, uh, that's, that's what I find really interesting is sort of matting with keying. I guess this is related to the whole idea of cleaning up footage. Uh, I noticed that a lot of people seem to spend time doing manual rotoing, and there's definitely some interesting technology out there that will help with this. This is definitely research, but um, you know, maybe we could have something where 
you do a rough roto to define the inside of a foreground element and some rough roto on the background, and then based on image statistics of the two, you could potentially separate them in, a, in an easier way than what we're doing today. So that's something I've been thinking about. If you guys wanted to chat about that after, I'm happy to discuss particular features. So I think that's all I have. Is there any questions for either Sergey or myself? You mentioned, yeah. you mentioned in your <laughs> initial presentation uh, about uh, uh, being able to proxy anything. Yeah, and, I mean, um, uh, the idea of uh, copy and write proposal is mm -hmm. to, it, it might be really easy extended to support proxies because proxies is also about being uh, able to have copies of the same data block multiple times. And this current proposal, you kind of make this working. But you'll have like really huge memory override, uh, overhead, and stuff like this. And it's easy to add stuff like earlier uh, compression of this data to store only data which is being uh, modified in this particular proxy. And these things fit uh, pretty nice into proposed copy and write uh, things. So. And, and what about like modifying properties without proxying if you have linked? stuff, like directly modifying link properties as a... Uh, as so you, you're going to modify property of a linked object? Yeah, I mean, we already do this. Um, well, I mean, you can we do, do this with Python, Python but I but, mean... Uh, but why not be able to do it in the UI as well? I mean, why do well, we... Then force... you would need to create proxy. I mean, in this case, like, Blender can automatically create proxy for you or so. Like, it might happen. Like, if proxy will be, like, really lightweighted, why not? You might not notice it. Being there. Yeah. Cool. So. Okay, that's my question. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Uh, about the camera tracker, are there any plans to implement depth, uh, depth data so we get like a grayscale image out of the depth? Uh, Ah, you're asking if we're going to consider adding dense stereo matching or, or just multi-view reconstruction for... Uh, no, out of a, of a single video, just to take the depth data and put it on a grayscale image so we can add, like, depth of field to a video. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what you're asking about exactly. So are you imagining a, a single image just a single image or a video? No, uh, out of a video data. Mm -hmm. So out of a video, you track the uh, depth data, and then you put uh, the depth data uh, to a grayscale image. So you have the depth as a grayscale image. So, so you're saying that the video would have depth input, so RGBZ video, or are you looking to recover the depth from the video? Yeah, recover the depth. OK, so that's, so that's dense stereo reconstruction, okay. or dense multi-view reconstruction. Currently, I don't have any plans to implement that. It's, it's a big task, and personally, I have limited time to dedicate to Blender. Uh, I would love to do it. I think it's a very fun topic, and, and it is interesting. Um, but given my time constraints, I'll probably not be doing that. Of course, if someone wants to do it, I would happily supervise. Somebody else? Oh, oh, oh. I know I missed uh, the beginning part, but um, have you guys thought about uh, planar tracking? <laughs> uh, that was in the, in the middle of the do you, mean, actually. do you mean this one? Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> that wasn't in the beginning. That was in the middle. I mean, the planar tracking is a little different than what you see in, in Mocha and the other projects, so it's, it's slightly more manual, but you can still get the job done. So that's um, based on the image, image base, right? Not points. So the you track points, but a plane is just defined by four or more points, wow. and then the motion is solved from those points. 
Do you have one more question? Time for more questions? Do you have? No, I don't have any more questions. No, no, no. Do you have time for more questions? One more question. One more question. I yeah. see. see question. Thank you, Sergey. I have a technical question for you about this trading. You okay. said that there are some operations like memory copy and some problems regarding to this. So I would like to ask you what kind of library are you using and what kind of trading it is? It's uh, realized by C or Python on which level and why there is a problem with memory on copy? Because I know about that it, in these libraries I know about trading, uh, this operation is already done. It's very obvious to sometimes you have to avoid well, copying. I mean, uh, in current trunk, uh, there, there is a guarded allocator which keeps stacks on allocated data blocks. And before my work, it had uh, global logs and it didn't allow to do allocations uh, in, in, in separate threads at the same time. And one of the, pro one of the parts was to make it uh, log three guarded allocator, which was first uh, step to make uh, memory uh, allocator be uh, friendly for trading. And another thing to be considered here is we are using JALOC, uh, which is written by, I believe, for Mozilla originally, for Mozilla Firefox, which is uh, friendly for trading and uh, allocates uh, memory in, in blocks which are predictable for caching. But uh, these two things are much, um, much more time consuming for memory copying. I mean, memory copying is, you cannot affect on memory copy a lot. It's just like you make sure that uh, data blocks are like, close enough to each other and there is no cache uh, misses in, uh, in the CPU cache. And this is the only thing we, we, we can control, uh, actually. Um, not so much room to play with here. So a big applause for Sergey and Kier. Thank you. Pretty much set up. Awesome, thank you very much.